Hello! Welcome to an adventure. Today we are exploring the Books That Made the Difference Project collection uh, on this episode of Archival Adventures. I believe it's episode number 11 today. Uh, I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here at um, here at Virginia Tech. I know where I am. Uh, anyway, before we begin, I just have a couple of announcements or a couple of acknowledgements to make. Uh, we acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. We also acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. We pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Further, we acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. We acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and, uh, and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. So now, we begin today's adventure. Uh, couple things, couple things. <laughs> Gotta get organized. Um, I do have the finding aid for today, which is where we're gonna start. Um, going to go ahead and get that ready and we'll switch over to that view. And as always, if something is odd with the stream, do let me know. Uh, there should be some music. If it's too loud, let me know that, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, hi, Hannah. Welcome in. Welcome in. And 16-bit Eric reigning with a party of 36. Welcome, whimsies. Welcome. Um, I'll switch back to the face view for a minute to say hello to everybody. Um, it is always lovely to have a, a group of whimsies show up. I do see, <laughs> oh, uh, Kira, thank you so much for giving the, the shout out to Eric. Um, if you happen to be here on my channel and you aren't already following 16-Bit Eric, he is completely worth a follow, absolutely a wonderful streamer, does a lot of just chatting. Today was playing um, some Valheim. Uh, Melba, thank you for the resub. Um, and yes, uh, we're here for a show called Archival Adventures. Um, ooh, hi Scribbler, hi P.A. Perryman, hi Lord Portico. Um, we're here for a, a show called Archival Adventures. This is a show I do every Wednesday from 2.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time now. Um, and basically, I pick a collection from the uh, collection, the special collections in University Archives at Virginia Tech, and we look through it together. Um, I most often have never seen the collection before, as is the case with the one today, which is the books that made a books that made the difference project. Um, and so we were just about to look at the finding aid for today's collection. Uh, Kira, I believe, has dropped links to the finding aid in the chat. If there's something you see listed in the finding aid that you really would like me to make sure I get to on the stream, do let me know and I will prioritize pulling that folder and, and we'll have a chance to look through it. Otherwise, um, I'm going to go ahead and pop over to the finding aid so that we can look at it together, get a sense of what is this collection that we're looking at, why does it exist, um, and then we'll start looking at the materials. So I'm going to switch views here to the screen share once more, um, which I should have done when on a different window. Uh, <laughs> sorry for the um, <laughs> multiple layers of views there. Uh, anyway, here's the finding aid um, zoomed in a little bit. This is on a site called Virginia Heritage, which hosts finding aids for most of the um, <coughs> professional uh, public memory institutions in Virginia, so that would be like archives and possibly like some museums and things like that as well. Um, a lot of the finding aids uh, are going to be on this site. Um, oh, I'm going to just remove the query from this URL so that we don't have all those words highlighted. I should have done that before I started. There we go. <clears throat> so the books that made the difference project collection, um, 
our collection number for it is MS 1985-003, which from that I know that we acquired it sometime around 1985. The acquisition information says that it was donated to us in 1986. Oh, Wraith Faith, thank you. <laughs> Wow. Oh, and over 40. Thank you for the follow. Um, so here's a, a little bit of historical information about this project. Uh, in a project jointly sponsored by the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress and the College of Arts and Sciences of the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, Virginia Tech, the Books That Made the Difference project sought to discover how important a role books played in shaping people's lives. The project was planned, administered, and promoted by Anne Heidbretter, Anne Heidbretter Eastman, Director of Public Affairs Programs, College of Arts and Sciences at Virginia Tech. Ooh, I've got it on this screen too. I don't have to look to the side quite so much. Um, uh, executed by Gordon Sabine, a professor of journalism at Virginia Tech, and his wife Patricia, an assistant professor at Ohio State University. The Sabines traveled across the country from July 1980 to March 1981, interviewing approximately 1,400 Americans and asking them two questions. What book made the greatest difference in your life? And what was that difference? <clears throat> they interviewed a panoply of people, from celebrities and authors to farmers and laborers, who named books from the Bible to Raggedy Ann. The answers were collected for a book published in 1983, by Shoestring Press, Books That Made the Difference, What People Told Us. In addition, the Books That Made a Difference idea was promoted nationally. For example, Gordon Sabine's interview on National Public Radio's All Things Considered, in which listeners were asked to write NPR about significant books in their lives. And as the theme of national library ceremonies, such as the, the American Book Awards. The concept was also used on a local scale from promotional ideas for libraries given in the back of the book. In 1985, the Book of the Month Club published an abridged version of the book. So that gives a little bit of information about kind of what this project was, why we're looking at it, um, you know, kind of just the background that we need to understand the material that we're going to encounter in this collection. Um, and then we have a scope and content note here that kind of tells us what, what there is in this collection. Um, administrative and promotional subject files, center for the book material, magazine and newspaper clippings, correspondence, manuscript drafts, book of the month club material, and audiovisual material. There is no way we will get to absolutely everything in this collection in two hours, so if we come across something that just doesn't seem terribly interesting, we'll put it aside and keep moving because there is a lot of material here. Um, with that, I'm going to switch us over to the document view and we'll start taking a look at items from this collection. <coughs> Pardon me. There are a lot of windows to manage to do two streams at once. Okay. Um, so what we have here is actually not part of the collection itself. This item is the book that was published as a result of the project. Books That Made the Difference, What People Told Us, Gordon, by Gordon and Patricia Sabine, with a foreword by Daniel J. Borstein. And this is a, a book that's in our special collections. It's in our Rare Books collection. It was actually in off-site storage and I had to request it and, and have it brought to the main library so that I could have it on stream today and I got it literally walking in the building right before the show. So um, instead of putting our barcode and labels and stuff that you might see on a regular library book, how they'll put a label on the spine and there'll be like a sticker somewhere on the back or on the inside that um, has the barcode for scanning, our Rare Books collection, we put these little cards in and so we have the call number and everything here, and the barcode here, and this just gets inserted into the book. Um, so that is so that we're not making any permanent changes to the book. Um, and so Z1003.2, S2, 1983, 
is our call number for this item. This is copy two, which is what C2 means there. Um, the collection identified on this card is spec slash faculty, meaning special collections and identifying it as an item that was collected because it was a work done by faculty. We don't actually have a collection called spec faculty anymore. Um, so this would just be part of our general um, special collections material now. And then it's noted on here that it is in storage. Um, probably because it just doesn't get enough use for us to keep it on site and we just don't have enough space to keep everything on site. Um, it is inscribed for the Dean who made it all possible, Anne Eastman, 12 December 1984. And it is aging a bit. I'm not gonna, um, I don't wanna fully open it because the, the spine is a little bit fragile actually. Um, in this, essentially it's a paperback. Um, the, the outside is not glossy like a paperback normally is, but um, I don't want to like open it fully because it is a tiny bit fragile. But we can see the forward here. Uh, I'll see if I can zoom that just a little bit so that maybe it will be legible. I won't go much further, but there, that should be pretty good. The members of the Book of the Month Club, and they have numbered millions over the years, are people who believe that books make the difference. By building family libraries of good books, book clubs have been a great silent force in American education. What other American institution outside of our schools and libraries has done more to promote the habits of book buying and book reading and the love of books? Who can count all those who have been awakened to the varied delights of books by the shelf of book club selections at home and by the sight and memory of their parents, sisters, and brothers enjoying those books? The Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, founded by law in 1977, also has been promoting the fellowship of books. Funded by private co contributions from individuals and corporations, the Center aims to see that books do not go unread, that they are not lost by neglect nor drowned by specious alternatives or synthetic substitutes. The Center also aims to spur the diffusion of books across our country and around the world, and to use all technologies to promote books and their reading. For example, for five years, the Read More About It project, co-sponsored with the CBS Television Network, has brought performers to the screen to suggest books for enjoyable follow-up reading after their featured programs. Read more about it, suggestions are also heard on CBS Radio. The Center aims to remind us that books make the difference to our nation as well as to individuals. So I, I laughed a little bit at the, um, the Center aims to see that books do not go unread that they are not lost by neglect nor drowned by specious alternatives or synthetic substitutes, which sounds like a direct attack against um, ebooks and audiobooks. Uh, except this is from 1983, and ebooks didn't even weren't even a glimmer on the horizon at that point. So um, maybe this was aimed at audiobooks. I'm not sure exactly what that is taking aim at with specious alternatives and synthetic substitutes but it certainly sounds like, um, like it's directed at those alternative forms of book, which honestly, however you can consume the content, uh, however it, you're able to engage with it best is how I would support doing it. Um, I personally have not managed to read a book that wasn't an audiobook since, well, since a month ago, but um, <laughs> haven't managed to read a book that wasn't an audiobook for the most part uh, since I finished grad school, or actually since I entered grad school, because I just had too much grad school reading to do. I It, it became very hard to do just leisure reading. <clears throat> In fact, the book that I read like a month ago wasn't for leisure. It was me rereading a book to run a 
uh, streamed one shot of a role playing game about that book or inspired by that book. Um, let's see what we have. I'm just going to pull the first chunk of folders and we'll see what's in them. Because I have not looked ahead. Comics, just here for coffee, that is a good idea of what they might have been taking aim at. <clears throat> I don't see why comics should be something we take aim at. Comics are storytelling as well. Yeah, uh, Beth, digital books like Kindle weren't a thing. They, they weren't even a glimmer on the horizon in the 1980s, so I'd, I'm not sure. Like, if this had been, if that forward was written in, like, 2000 or something, but that book was published in 83, so I, I don't know what they're referring to. Anyway, we've got an archival folder here. Let me zoom back out. Haha. -ha. All right, we have... Sabine's Vitas and Photos. So that's going to be <coughs> information about the people who worked on the project. Vitas being curriculum vitae. Um, I would assume. Just glancing at it to see what kind of personal information might be on these before I show it on stream. Um, I can do this by just making sure the very top of it doesn't show, and then addresses and phone numbers won't be on screen. <laughs> yeah, that's before the Mac. Portable microfilm readers instead of e-readers, that, that would be a little scary, Wraith. <laughs> Yeah, Hannah, I don't, I'd like, personally, like, however you're able to consume content, it, it's, the story is what matters. So if comics are how you engage, do comics. One of the best discoveries that I ever had in grad school was um, during a class in the programming, the, the database language SQL, um, there was the Manga Guide to Databases that was used as a primer for students who just had never done anything with databases in the past. And it was great. It conveyed the information in a way that a lot of people found more, in, more easy to engage with than a standard book format would do. Um, so it was, it was like a comic book, because a manga is, is a certain style of kind of comic book uh, printing. Um, but it was a guide explaining how relational databases work, and it was amazing. And to this day, I think the Manga Guide to Databases is a wonderful, wonderful book that I would absolutely recommend to anybody who's wanting to learn about databases. There are some interesting things already happening. I found a folder inside a folder. Anyway, this. <clears throat> what is on screen here is the vitae of Gordon Sabine, who was one of the project leaders. Um, I've cut off the top where his name is, partly because there's an address and phone number there, which um, probably well out of date by now, but I'm still not going to want to share them on screen. Um, you used to read more books than kind of lost interest, but in the last couple years you got into comics. Yeah, uh, sometimes it can just be really hard. And one thing I discovered, most of the people who went through um, a graduate program in library and information science with me, and most people who I've talked to who've gone through graduate studies in library and information science, just don't have time to read for, for any pleasurable purpose. Um, from the time they enter grad school until well after, it's just like, nope, 
can't handle anymore. I, I saw a post from a very famous librarian that I follow on Twitter who taught at my school um, just the other day saying that she finally, may have finally just gotten her ability to read books again back. And she's been in the profession for decades. So it's, it's a thing. Sometimes you just burn out on it. And, and however you're still able to engage with the content is great. Uh, for me, um, it's mostly audiobooks. But OK, so Gordon Sabine, we can see he's got journalism and economics, bachelor's, master's in journalism, um, PhD in political science, and worked as a reporter. So he's going to be good at interviewing people or at least presumably so, because basically journalism, and he worked as a reporter for many, many years in different places. Um, so probably a good fit for this kind of assignment. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on their, their resumes, but I thought that was interesting when I pulled it up and saw um, reporter. Yeah, your parents talked about how it took them a few years, a few years after college before they could just read for fun again. They were both English and teaching majors. Yeah, it, it seems to be a pretty common thing for library science in particular, but I could definitely see it for English as well. Um, oh, we got photos. I knew there were photos mentioned. They're glossies, so I'm putting on gloves. <coughs> So this is going to be Gordon, Gordon Sabine, uh, who was one of the, oh, I'm going to, does that make a difference? That doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Let me see if I angle it a little, if I can get rid of kind of that glare. Um, this photo is from US News and World Report, apparently. see if I've got, oh, there's, there's one in here with him and his wife who worked on this together. So here they are. They're basically the people who went around the country asking people, hey, what book really made a difference in your life and what was that difference? Um, which I think is a great concept for kind of exploring the meaning of books within our society. Um, I have not read the book yet. I honestly didn't know that this project even existed until I saw it listed in our finding aids and decided to pull it for this week for this uh, exploration. Um, let's see, what do we have in folder number three? Folder number three says State Librarians. I don't know what to expect to find in here, but we shall see. State librarians. Um, you can see there are metal paper clips in here. Um, so this collection was processed to a certain extent. Uh, it wasn't processed to the point where we removed metal paper clips, <clears throat> which is recommended, partly because the paper clips themselves can do damage over time just by the way they crimp and bend pages but then also the metal can rust over time and cause rust damage to the paper as well um, and these are <laughs> these are di directors of libraries apparently Got some library addresses, the director's names, and some dollar amounts, but it doesn't say what those dollar amounts are. So not knowing the context for these at the moment, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because there are going to be much more interesting things. And rather than puzzle over this information, I'm going to move on to the next folder. Travel schedule. Box one, folder four. Let's 
Let's see. Librarians for Anne. Please to write about November 1. New Orleans on November 24th. Minneapolis on December 2nd. Madison, Wisconsin, presumably, <clears throat> on December 3rd. I note that they already had a contact with Nancy Marshall, Assistant Director of the University of Wisconsin Libraries. And then again on December 4th. Oh no, December 4th was Chicago. So it started out in New Orleans and then jumped up to the, the upper Midwest. Uh, and then Boston and then Lexington slash Concord, New York City. There's a note here, John Cole on December 12th in Washington area. And because of the way that this itinerary reads, I'm assuming that's Washington DC rather than Washington state. And then uh, December 15th, it looks like back in the Blacksburg area, which is where Virginia Tech is located, where they would have been working out of to start all of this. There's a letter here. Hey, nice lady. That was good of you to go, go to all that trouble to come here, and Pat and I appreciate it. Uh, Fader was most impressive. When we get him transcribed one almost full hour without stopping, we'll share the tape with you. The enclosed is for art to enjoy. I've started contacts with the Screenwriters Guild and AFTRA and one more performers union. Hopefully some actions this coming week. In Lansing, we did get the Oldsmobile Cutlass assembly line worker, 1984, but it won't happen here because we're too smart. That was, sorry, a quotation, 1984. But it won't happen here because we're too smart. Uh, he was a utility man on the bumper assembly portion of the assembly line. We'll pull back a little on the telephone interviews with folks in every state, but right now I feel we want to do the complete November-December trip without shaving it just to save a hundred bucks. What the heck, it's just money. So thanks for all the help and send the additional info as soon as convenient, please. Your obedient servant, G. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, old lined ruled paper here. All right, I'm gonna poke at a couple of folders here and see what I can find. I wanna get to some of the interviews. Um, what, whatever we have. Public Relations Survey. Rental of ALA membership lists. This is all stuff about how they're gonna go about doing PR, but it's very administrative um, about how they're gonna get names of people to contact, stuff like that, not about the actual like design of the PR releases or anything. Uh, oh, this is interesting. We can look at this one. Releases. Okay. Okay, okay. I may not... We'll look at this one folder and then we'll look at the finding aid again uh, because the finding aid will tell us if something sounds interesting and then we can pull the folder. Uh, rather than just doing this folder by folder thing that I've been doing, we'll actually encounter the collection the way that it's intended to be encountered. <laughs> All right, so here we have um, a letter from March 25th, 1981. It says, for further information, Anne Heidbrenner Eastman. Uh, and Heidbreder Eastman. Um, I won't read the whole thing because it's pretty long, but it seems interesting. Tech faculty members find out what a difference a book makes. Has a book or books made a difference in your life? What was the book? What was the difference? Two members of the Virginia Tech faculty, Gordon Sabine and Ann Eastman, have collaborated for the past year on a project 
of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress to ask people across the country to answer these questions. Dr. Sabine is a professor of journalism on leave in 1980 to 1981. Ms. Eastman is director of public affairs programs in the College of Arts and Sciences. She is also a member of the founding executive committee for the Center for the Book, which was established by Congress in October 1977 to stimulate appreciation of the book by exploring issues related to the crucial role of books and the printed word in our society by encouraging reading and by encouraging research. At a meeting of the Reading Development Committee in February 1980, it was suggested that Americans be asked whether books had changed their lives, and if so, which books and how. Ms. Eastman returned to Blacksburg to ask Dr. Sabine whether he knew someone who would be interested in participating in this project. He did. Patricia L. and Gordon A. Sabine. So that is a lovely little beginning of a write-up of how the project got started. Also, since we're here talking about it, if you have a book that made a difference in your life, I would love to hear what the book was and what that difference was. For me, uh, the book that made a difference in my life was It was by Neil Stevenson. It was, I think its title was Quicksilver. Uh, it was the first in a trilogy of books, which is the only reason I'm struggling at all. Um, so it, Ultimately, it's the entire Baroque cycle by Neil Stevenson that made a difference in my life. Um, yes, Quicksilver was volume one of the Baroque cycle. That is the particular one that made a difference in my life because there was a contest associated with a poster that was put out with a special limited edition release of the book. I loved these books so much that I bought the special limited edition and then um, got the poster, found out there was a contest, um, and decided to kind of tackle the contest for myself, uh, which involved um, a script known as Real Character. And I visited the special collections at the University of Iowa. It was the very first time I had ever entered a special collections. They had a copy of um, Oh, brain, 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 brain. Um, they had a copy of the Reverend John Wilkins's uh, publication, An Essay Towards a Real Character and a Philosophical Language from 1668, which described the mechanics and function of real character, which was what this poster had been made in and um, <clears throat> so the contest that was related to the book Quicksilver uh, caused me to visit the University of Iowa Special Collections to access that publication from 1668 so that I could translate the poster which had instructions on how to submit for winning the contest. And the prize for the contest was a signed ARC, a signed numbered um, advanced reader copy of the second book in the trilogy, um, the, uh, the Confusion. And, um, but how it changed my life was it put me in a special collections for the first time. Um, it was the first time I had ever made the attempt. It was the first time I'd ever even thought of the fact that rare books were housed somewhere and archives existed. And ultimately, that contest related to that book put me where I am today, working in special collections and university archives here at Virginia Tech. So um, that's my story of a book that made a difference in my life. And I would love to hear if you all have books that made a difference in your life. If you want to pop that into chat, it would be lovely um, to know that. Uh, but let's go ahead and I'm going to pull up the finding aid again and we will look at folder names and see which ones which ones seem the most interesting because like I said there's a lot of content in this collect collection 
and there's no way that we'll get to all of it. Right, so project proposal with draft, the vitas and photographs, state librarians contacted, travel schedules, public relations survey, press releases, Spokane Public Library, Dana Library, idea search poster sessions. That could be interesting. So releases, press releases was one that sounded interesting. I don't know that poster sessions will be interesting um, since they're probably conference poster sessions and unless copies of the posters are in here, um, probably not terribly interesting, but we'll see. PM Magazine, PM Magazine. Council for Florida Libraries Book and Author Festival Packet and Promotional Tour Materials. Promotional materials. That's a good one. Promotional materials is good. Shoestring press material. Inclusions. Reader's Digest material. Box one, folder 22 to 23. Correspondence as well as publicity. So 30 and 31. And again, if you see a folder title that sounds like it would be interesting and you'd like me to pull it out and for us to take a look at it, I am more than happy to do so. Just let me know in chat which folder you'd like to see. Letters to State Librarians, General. National Public Radio Interview, Box 2, Folder 10. Also, I have three boxes of audio cassette tapes. Um, I do not have digital recordings. They've not been um, converted to digital, so we can't listen to them today. But if people are interested in hearing some of the interviews from this, I could look at digitizing some and we could listen to them on another day. Two ten. Hmm. NPR, NPR, NPR. Well, all right. Let's look at some of the th these, and we can pull more later. Move this. I'm trying to be organized. It is not working so well today. I'm also off screen, aren't I? <coughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, let's go back to the document focus here. <laughs> And make sure I've got the chats up so that I can see them. Okay, so here we have, I'll just show this off. This is literally a box of audio cassette tapes. These audio cassettes are interviews. So this is tape 27. Um, side A has Ed Newman, Nina, and Tom Keenan. And side B has Tom Keenan, James Fox. And so these are actual audio recordings of the interviews that they did for this project. Um, this is how they are currently stored. This ultimately, uh, for long-term preservation, 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 uh, we will want to digitize just because the audio cassette 
itself can deteriorate over time. Um, digital files also have their own drawbacks, but um, ultimately, eventually, those tapes will be unlistenable because the tape itself will deteriorate. And so we'll want to at least make a copy of it, um, which would be digitizing it in some form. Although I, uh, this collection is likely a low priority for that, but. Um, oh, this is the folder I was just looking for to put this away. The next folder we're gonna look at is poster sessions. <laughs> We'll see what's in here. <clears throat> All right, we have a letter here, August 13th, 1982. To Ms. Judith O'Sullivan, Executive Director of the Center for the Book at the Library of Congress. From E. Jane Harrison, Secretary to Anne E. Eastman. Dear Ms. O'Sullivan, enclosed, please find a set of 32 labels. Uh, these names are of the people Ms. Eastman met at the poster session in Philadelphia in July. All of these people would like to receive a poster for the Books That Made a Difference project. <laughs> you can imagine this would have been an email in today's today's world, but instead it was a, a very formal letter. Um, here we have very thin paper and Hydebreder Eastman, books make a difference. Uh, it was good to be in the exhibit area, but we would have done better if we had been opposite commercial booths, not small presses. The display boards should have been face out for the audience. Um, what they saw coming down the aisles were edges of the boards. So feedback on the setup that they had at the conference, um, which I don't know which conference it was, but it's a letter here um, on American Library Association stationery. Application for the 1982 ALA Poster Sessions in Philadelphia was accepted by the Review Committee. So, a natural place for them to want to share information, present about the project, would be the American Library Association. Let's see. Guidelines for doing poster sessions. Yeah, just more, nothing about the actual posters that they did. It's very administrative stuff about um, getting into poster sessions and things like that. <clears throat> so let's look at some of the promotional materials from this project. Oh, sorry, trying to show you the folder labeled promotional materials. Um, here's where I got the uh, image for the tweets about today's uh, broadcast. Um, I grabbed this promotional card and scanned it. Um, it is a postcard. And so on the front you can see <laughs> various historical images with red books inserted into them. Uh, we've got the thinker holding a book. We've got uh, Washington crossing the Delaware, and he's got a book in his hand. We have, I'm assuming this is Armstrong on the, on the moon, um, holding a book. Uh, and we've got, I believe, Babe Ruth with a book in his belt. Uh, <laughs> and on the back, the postcard reads, Books Make a Difference, a program of the Center for the Book and the, in the Library of Congress. The center, established by Act of Congress in 1977, exists to keep the book flourishing. How? Through a stimulating program of exhibitions, seminars, symposia, and publications, all supported through the generosity of individuals, corporations, and foundations. Want more information? 
Wright, Center for the Book, Library of Congress, Washington, D.C. And then we have little bookmarks because almost every book related project, like universally can be relied upon to have little paper bookmarks. If it is a library related or book related project, there are little paper bookmarks. Uh, <laughs> so um, this bookmark is Books Make a Difference, the 1981 American Book Awards. And here we've got a little post-it note from 1984. There's a thing. Would you ever think, oh dear, I've definitely held that too long. Um, would you ever think that you wrote a post-it note and that post-it note was going to be preserved for, ooh, how many years has it been since 1984? Uh, <laughs> that is math I can't do in my head. I am terribly sorry. Minus 1984. 37 years. Um, this person, thank you, just here for coffee, uh, wrote a post-it note in 1984, and that post-it note is now part of history. This is one copy of each piece of information which was sent to Joan Irwin upon inquiry as to how to go about doing a project like Books Make a Difference. Um, so there's the tiny little bookmark. Here in this set, there's also another bookmark, a larger bookmark that appears to be that Books Make a Difference branded bookmark. Um, I'm not gonna pull this apart. It's all held together by the post-it note at the moment, and I'm not gonna take it apart because I don't really need to at the moment. Um, and so I'd rather not deal with 37-year-old adhesive at the moment, so I'm just gonna leave it all stuck together. But it is there, we do have it, and if somebody needed to get access to it, we could remove the post-it note. Um, but again, post-it adhesive, not, not too bad as adhesives go, but still 37-year-old post-it adhesive. It's still stuck strong. Um, Oops, I didn't want to zoom in. I wanted to zoom out. Okay, uh, here we have a poster on poster board. The 1981 American Book Award nominees, books make a difference. Uh, you can see it creased across the center. This has definitely been folded. It's been folded in the actual folder itself, um, which would not generally be my preferred way of uh, preserving it, I would want to flatten it out. Um, but again, it seems like partial processing on this. Um, let's switch views here real quick, because we have a nice large poster. So this is the nominees for the 1981 American Book Awards. We've got uh, Shirley Hazard, The Transit and Venue of Venues, a novel. We have William Maxwell, So Long, See You Tomorrow. Wright uh, Morris, Wright Morris, Plains Song. Walker Percy, The Second Coming. The Collected Stories of Eudora Welty. Um, so a, a variety of things here and somewhere on here is, oh, here down at the bottom, Books Make a Difference. Watch for winners, April 30th. So. They managed to get the project branding included in the American Book Awards, um, which definitely raises the profile of the project itself. And we've got <laughs> even more material about the Book Awards. some of the branding material. There are definitely documents in here about planning the awards ceremony and, and things like that as well. Um, 
these are just more visual, which is probably like why I'm leaning towards showing them. These are the children's nominees. The Night Swimmers by Betsy Byers. Uh, oh boy, babies! <laughs> oh, there's a Bever Beverly Cleary on here, Ramona and her mother. So. All right. Back to document focus. For immediate release. This month, <clears throat> All America joins in honoring the authors nominated for the 1981 American Book Awards. Store or Library invites you to join in the celebration. Showcased in the Store or Library are all of the nominated books in a wide array of categories. Whatever is your reading interest, fiction, nonfiction, biography, history, poetry, science, you will find on display the best of literally thousands of books published in the United States during 1980. Pick up copies of your own personal award-winning titles before the winners are announced nationally on April 30th. You could never read the Ramona books? I, I don't think I, I don't know that I've ever read them either, but it was definitely a title I recognized. Um, there's a promotional kit here for year two. For the American Book Awards. This is an interesting way to do it. All the pages are cut smaller got the program, the advertising, the publicity, merchandising, and window display. Let's see what else we have, what else we have. Put these promotional materials back in their folder so they do not get lost. Ooh. So this folder, with the messy top here, um, this is Reader's Digest interview transcripts. So. Let's see what we have. These are on the back of old standardized test forms. And this one I'm not gonna do because I can't tell exactly where it starts. So we'll look for one of these that I can actually do from. Our aim will be to show that the structure of modern society affects man in two ways simultaneously. He becomes more independent, self-reliant, and critical. And he becomes more isolated, if alone, and afraid. This feels like I'm coming in in the middle of something. Is there a beginning? I'm very curious. I want, I want interviews. Quotes from Throne. Mini Pearl. Well. I'm trying to find things that make sense. All of these seem to pick up in the middle of of something. Okay, here's one. 
Ray of Hope. Her family had grown and she was 40 when she enrolled at the University of Iowa as a freshman. Four years later, she was graduated with honors, but not before a shocking incident through which she discovered the book that made the greatest difference to her. It was Beyond, Ourse Beyond Ourselves by Catherine Marshall, widow of Peter Marshall, the late chaplain of the U.S. Senate. I read this shortly before Bill's death, Elnora Ross said. It was during the month we were separated and he was telephoning and threatening my life and drinking so heavily and I was in such confusion, such turmoil. I wanted this marriage to work. I wanted it to last. I could see that he what he was doing to himself. I knew what he would do to me if I let him come home, knowing that he was still drinking so heavily and that as before, I would be hurt physically. He would beat me up again. And yet, when he was not drinking, the relationship was pure heaven. So I was torn almost completely down the middle, right in half. You know, I wish that I had read a little ahead in this and had given a warning. Um, hi, Diamond. Welcome in. Um, about the content. Um, I'm going to see if I've got another one that I can read instead, if, instead of going further into that. Um, ooh. These transcripts. This one's pasted together from multiple pieces of paper. Uh, this, will, this one could be interesting. It's very interesting that they've chosen to just paste this together into one long page. Uh, Marcus Cohn was well on his way to earning his first million dollars. The firm of lawyers he headed in Washington, D.C. was the country's largest, specializing in broadcast and media law. He worked weekdays and weekends, early in the morning until midnight if necessary. He took work home. Uh, he took it with him on vacations. The son of Russian immigrants he knew his goal, prestige, power, money. Always more clients, more success, more money. But something was myth missing. He felt like a slave to his profession. He hardly knew his children. He and his wife had almost no social life. He became restless and started making, uh, and started asking, is that all there is to life? Then in the early 1960s, a book came to his rescue. It literally saved my sanity, he remembers. It told me who I was and what my problem was. It told me how to start living again. I read the first chapter and said to myself, my God, he's writing about me. Then I never put the book down. I didn't even eat until I finished it. For Eric Fromm, the famous Austrian psychologist and eventually the author of some two dozen books, this was his first. He just fled Hitler's Europe for the United States, and some of that experience was reflected in both the title and the subject, Escape from Freedom. The book says that freedom from oppressive rulers or from poverty can be both good and bad. All too often, it's a trap. We can't decide exactly what we want to do in life, so we borrow uh, ready-made goals from someone else. Then we become slaves to that way of life, which makes us into automatons, just like all the other automatons. And we become weak and afraid and slip back into bondage or slavery again. I surely fit that pattern, Cohn declares. I lived, ate, and breathed that law firm. I lived a vertical life, always up, up, up the ladder, and I was going all the way to the top. Then Eric Fromm became my therapist. It was as though I were sitting at his feet, having a personal dialogue with him. He turned my life around. Cohn cut back to a normal work week. He spent more time with a hobby, the theater. He took his son for a month's sightseeing through the southern US. He dazzled his young daughter with a weekend in New York City, a plush suite at a fancy hotel, dancing, seeing the sights. The kids must have been saying, this isn't the same old dad we used to know, Cone chuckles. But all I'd done before was kiss them goodnight. 
he put in a pool and learned to swim. When he was 60, he learned to water ski. He and his wife drove around Italy for a month. So totally unscheduled, his office couldn't reach him. And he took off a week or two every year to attend a seminar at the Aspen Institute for Humani uh, Humanistic Studies on subjects far removed from either law or broadcasting. This made him a better lawyer, he's convinced. As I do more thinking outside the strict structures of the law, I'm able to bring back to the office more intelligence, more background. I'm more sensitive and more involved with the rest of the world. I've exposed myself more to other people's thoughts. Through all his longer and longer absences, the firm continued to succeed, and even his attitude toward money has changed. I realized that once one has security, how insecure I realized that once one has security, how inconsequential money is. It's just pieces of papers, numbers on pieces of paper. Oh sure, there's a certain amount of ego satisfaction in making more money, but that raises the question of whether making money is the beginning and ending of life. Unfortunately, too many lawyers, too many persons in all professions, too many persons everywhere are completely dedicated to just that one thing. That makes them slaves. What they need is what I needed, an escape from their own kind of freedom. They ought to read that book. Another of Frome's books made the difference to Mary Langan, editor and writer, Fairbanks, Alaska. I went to a convent school and heard a lot about Christian love, but never really understood what it meant until I read Eric Frome's The Art of Loving. Frankly, we didn't get a lot of love from the nuns. There was a lot of rivalry between the girls and them, and it was hard to love someone you didn't like. But Fromm explained love more as sympathy with their view, understanding where they came from and their feelings. I learned that love was sort of walking in the other person's moccasins and seeing how you might have been that way too if you'd had their background. I was brought up to believe you had to save yourself for a man, be a virgin, go into marriage pure, and then, you have, then you'd have a beautiful life. But Frome said you can't start loving somebody all of a sudden. Love is something you develop. You get along with other people. It's a skill, an art to be developed. When I started living that way, I had a lot better relationship with people. I stopped being so afraid of a love relationship with a man. Before I was trying to save myself for Prince Charming, I waited 15 years for him and he never came along and Eric Frome made me understand I wasn't being realistic. Everyone I get close to now, I'm closer to than the person before because I'm getting better at the art of loving. Yeah, I'm not familiar with this author either, but apparently uh, two of his books had significant impact on the lives of these two people. Um. <laughs> Non-standard paper sizes are your jam. I think, uh, Diamond, that that was actually standard eight and a half by 11 paper that was it was glued together in pieces and then run through a typewriter because that was definitely done on a typewriter. Um, this is the folder that I will probably spend most of the rest of the time on this because this, this is the core of what this project was about. These are transcripts of people's actual stories of what books made a difference to them. And as I said, if you want to share a book that made a difference for you, I would, I would love to know. <laughs> um, so this is labeled number nine. What is wrong with a woman wanting to make money? In the spacious governor's mansion of Colorado, oh, according to Wikipedia, Frome was a German social psychologist, psychoanalyst, sociologist, humanistic philosopher, and democratic socialist. Thank you, Hannah. In the spacious governor's mansion of Colorado, the wife of the governor speaks about thoughts and feelings and emotions that could be every woman's. For Dottie Lamb, the book is Working It Out, edited by Sarah Ruddick and Pamela Daniels, the true stories of how 23 women managed to keep a creative work life going. It came at a time in my life when I was really needing to struggle with what kind of career I was going to turn to. Being the governor's wife and being the mother of the children was not really enough emotional satisfaction, although some people would say, my lord, that is all anyone, any woman could need. That was part of the problem. All along, women have been told that's all any woman could need. 
The fact is that work is just as important for women as it is for a man, or for men. One reason is creativity, another is money. What is wrong with a woman wanting to make money? Women always have worked, Mrs. Lamb says, and homemakers work harder than anyone else. So I do not mean to say homemakers are not workers. What I am saying is that it gave me more courage to carve out a personal area of work that was both paid and more satisfying to me than to do some of the kinds of work you get into that are connected with a family, like volunteer work and that sort of thing. This book made me decide to insist on being paid, not to feel guilty if it interfered with being chairwoman of this committee or that committee. I've made work a priority now, rather than a kind of second hobby. What she did was pull back from volunteerism and try to develop, pull back from volunteerism and try to develop my writing, to see if a major newspaper in Colorado would hire me, to see if indeed I could write. That was a big step because most people learn to write before they even approach a big newspaper. And I'd written only something like eight articles when I approached the Denver Post. The real writing, she says, came because I started writing my personal experiences during my husband's first campaign for governor. I never thought I would publish them, but I wrote them because it, well, it was kind of like I needed somebody to talk to. You're a political wife on the first campaign trip. You don't have time for personal friends anymore. And the writing kind of became my friend. After election, she read over her diary. I realized then that this wasn't really a political story that it was a story about being a wife of someone prominent in either public or private life, and that a lot of women could identify with it. So I had it published in a small Colorado magazine, and the comments I got from that made me decide to go on. Now she does a Monday editorial page column for The Post. I have a very interesting platform to be on, uh, to be on by writing for them, and I get letters based on what I write, not the fact that I'm the governor's wife. And I think that's where they decided to end it, but they had additional text. I write now because I feel I have an awful lot to say based on my experiences as a mother and a politician. Things to say not in terms of telling people what to do. It's not an advice column, but writing things that touch on people's lives and make them reevaluate their lives. If I can have any kind of influence on a woman or a man, and a lot of my mail comes from men now, like that book Working It Out had on me, that's enough of a goal for me in life forever. Mrs. Lamb, a graduate of Occidental College, was a United Airlines stewardess before marrying the attorney who later became governor. You don't know if they made a difference in your life or not, but some of your favorite books are Freckles and A Girl of the Limber Lost, both by Jean Stratton Porter and The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Orsi. Um, I'm not familiar with the, the two by Gene Stratton Porter, um, but thank you for the recommendation. I'm, I've also, I've never read The Scarlet Pimpernel. I'm familiar with the musical and love the musical. Um, so yes, I, I, I would also add my recommendation to The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Orsi. Uh, <laughs> ooh. I will be interested to see what you find, Diamond. <laughs> Um, let's see this one. So that's additional, additional, additional. Let's various drafts of the text for that overview about Dottie Lamb. Let's see what else do we have. So this one starts out, Heidi. More than 50 years ago, amid the tumult and clamor of the Franco-Prussian War, little Adelaide was born into the world of literature in which she has lived as a favorite figure of childhood ever since. There is something about her at once so innocent and sweet, so loyal and truthful, that she has earned herself unfail endeared herself unfailingly to those who read her life and she has come to occupy, occupy a secure place in the affections of young people of many different lands and languages. The pure mountain air of Switzerland breathes in the pages of Heidi's book, as does a sincere love for nature in her simpler and grander moods. 
The cramped dweller in cities and towns longs for the freedom of the open spaces and the highlands quite as earnestly as do our small heroine and meadow nuncle. Goat Peter is the very image of unfettered country boyhood, crippled Clara and the despondent doctor grow strong in the rude vigor that prevails on the sloping roof of the Swiss world. Perhaps a first reason for the sure hold that Heidi has won on the hearts of her own and a latter generation lies in the beautiful and unusual setting given to her story. But no one reads far into the quiet tale before its characters begin to live more really than most people he has actually met and known. Not for anything in the world would one have missed an acquaintance with Brigitte and the blind grandmother of Goat Peter's tumble-down cottage with the village pastor and meadow nuncle, and with Peter, the feather-minded general of the army of goats. Prim Miss Rottenmeyer is drawn from life with broad strokes of the pen, as are kind-hearted Sebastian and the blundering tutor and pert Tinette. Clara, the patient invalid in a sweetheart is a sweetheart, nothing less, and how do we and how we do agonize over her possible betterment and recovery. And one comes away from meeting Mr. Seaman, Mr. Sesaman, and his serene mother encouraged to a renewed faith in men and affairs. So I'm not familiar with Heidi, but that is a lovely write-up of that book. Jean Stratton Porter was an American author, and the two books listed are her best ones. Recommend reading them and reading Freckles first before Girl on a Limberlost, or Girl of the Limberlost. They both play, take place in the late 1800s to early 1900s in Indiana. And then The Scarlet Pimpernel was one that was part of your curriculum when you were in fifth or sixth grade. I would have expected it to be older. Wow. Uh, it was a book your mom read aloud to you, and it's been a favorite ever since. There's a movie version starring Jane Seymour that's pretty good as well. Nice. I, I will have to look for the movie, because I've never seen the musical. I love the soundtrack to the musical. Um, I've read synopses of the story. I, I find it interesting because it is about a roguish character who's part of the upper class. Um, so the, if you're not familiar with the Scarlet Pimpernel, the, the general story is about um, this rogue who is saving French nobility uh, who are scheduled to be put to death during the, um, the French Re Revolution. So uh, he basically kidnaps them and spirits them off out, out of the country, if I'm understanding the plot correctly. Um, and so he's definitely a rogue. He's definitely uh, sneaking around. Nobody knows who, they, who this character is. Um, but he's doing so in order to save the hated nobles that are going to be put to death. So it's kind of a, usually the rogues are the, the lower class. And so anyway, I, I find it interesting. And, I'm interested in it. Don't watch the A&E made for TV miniseries because it's awful. <laughs> the book is mostly from his wife's perspective. Interesting. Your Diamond, your main issue in pinpointing influential books is that you're more of a fiction. Well, there's nothing wrong with fiction being influential. You know of one that you think you read it once, but it's one of those lesser known books that somehow also ends up in a lot of classics collections. Oh. I'm not sure which one you're referring to. If it's um, Pimpernel. Or something else. Um. Here we've got another interview. Minnie Pearl, Mrs. Uh, Howard Cannon. The Bible made the greatest difference in my life of any book I ever read. It's the difference between living a life of despair and hopelessness and a life of joy and hope. The way I feel about it is my religion is a happy religion. 
And it's been worth so much to me in my career and in my life to have the joy and hope the Bible brings to me of life hereafter. I've never understood people who can't find joy in their religion. To me, joy in my, is my religion and my religion is joy. I think of the Bible as a book of hope. I grew up in a Christian family and I grew up in a family that read the Bible and taught the Bible and, and went to church and it would be hard for me to pinpoint any particular time when I first became conscious of the Bible. It probably was when my mother used to tell us Bible stories when we were very small. I came from a family of five girls. I lost my place because I glanced away. Uh, and when we were little, my mother and my father too, but particularly my mother, since she was at home with us, told us Bible stories. And she had us in church from the time we were in, from the time we were, in fact, she took me to church when I was just about born because they didn't have babysitters in those days and people just took their babies to church with them. And I was in the church since my earliest recollection and listening to Bible stories. Then when I got old enough to be in the nursery department, I remember the wonderful teacher who taught me Bible stories then when I was just a little, little girl. In fact, the Bible always been a part of my life. I was living in Centerville, Tennessee, when, which is 50 miles southwest of Nashville. My father was a lumberman. He had a sawmill and a retail lumber business in Centerville. The first Bible story I remember would be the Christian, the the Christmas story, because naturally Christmas is such a special time for children. And then another one I remember very distinctly from my childhood was the story of the Good Samaritan. It was always such an interesting thing to me that those people went by and let that man suffer there beside the road without looking that way or caring. I grew up in a caring family. Caring was, caring has always been a big word with me in my life. I have tried not to pass by on the other side. Uh, <clears throat> when I created Minnie Pearl, I created her for one purpose, and that was to bring joy and happiness. And I try in every way to do that. She is a happy person, and she exudes happiness to other people. And one of the bright spots of my life as I have moved into more or less my later years is that people say to me time after time over and over that they have laughed and they have felt a little better from having heard Minnie Pearl. And that's all I ask out of life and my career, is that people find happiness in Minnie Pearl. Oh, you meant Heidi. Uh, now I, I have to refresh my memory on Minnie Pearl. Interesting. Uh, it's cre the, the interview here is listed as Minnie Pearl, Miss Howard Cannon. Minnie Pearl was the stage name of Sarah Ophelia Colley Cannon, who has a name. It is not Mrs. Howard. It is Sarah Ophelia Colley Cannon. Um, and it was a, a character that she played. She was an American country comedian who appeared at the Grand Ole Opry for more than 50 years and on the television show Hee Haw from 1969 to 1991. I knew I recognized the name Minnie Pearl, but I didn't remember why. Let's see. I'm, I'm enjoying these transcripts. How about, how about you all? I think this is the most interesting part that I've found in this collection so far. <laughs> uh, this one is labeled uh, Genard 22703. Dad, lightweight fighter. Mother made him give up if he wanted to marry. 
older child, born Wheeling, West Virginia, Martin's Ferry, lived in coal mining camp, company houses, store that you owe your life to. <laughs> so that's little snippets. I'm uncertain exactly. It's, it's giving us some background on who this person is. Only other kids around were going to private kindergarten next door. Lady let me go without charge, no money at home. Six developed interest in history, read everything, cereal boxes, comic books. My friends had money I didn't have. So when I went to their houses to play, I'd see a stack of comics and I'd sit down and read them instead of playing. Same thing today. I get so engrossed in reading I can't hear anything else. My father would get so angry with me, he'd call me no answer. He'd go out around the neighborhood. I'd be back home reading in a corner. In second grade in, in one room school, listened to reading and other lessons through six years. Then went back to one grade room and was bored. Appetite for reading died off. I played football, sing in plays, student director of band, comics, any inventor, any historic character, got other books. Books a nickel, could buy very few, didn't get allowance. Started work having for, started work haying for neighbor when 11. When 14, father hurt. Jim drove coal truck by 15. Uh, shoveling on and off in summer, haul hay to racetrack. School library study hall, so bored with school. Read front row encyclopedia, seventh grade up. This one, it, it doesn't, it's not like a full transcript. It's a little difficult to piece together exactly what he's saying. Um, taking idea, uh, something and making something new out of it. How things were put together, human anatomy, still turned on by learning, how everything happens, generalist, taught high school and college chemistry, own home notebooks, neither graduated from high school, auto biz, always crazy about making things work, Superman and Batman and Robin, reading has educated me more than teachers did. As a freshman in college, did graduate level work in genetics because of uh, Professor Ohio State. Interest. I'm. Let's see if there's some more intelligible notes because that those are very short notes, rather than the more narrative form that was much easier to understand. Ah, okay. I think I have the narrative version now. <laughs> I just, everything just buffered for me for a minute, so hopefully everything is good and the stream is running fine. <clears throat> Johnard. What makes the difference doesn't have to be a classic or great literature or anything of the sort. It even could be comic books. Jim Johnard today manages a major automobile dealership in central Ohio. He has had a successful career as a college professor, high school chemistry teacher, recreation director, square dance caller, and assembly line supervisor. He's managed a chain of car washes and a swim pool. Uh, he's driven a coal truck and shoveled it full and empty. He's worked at what he could, where he could for whatever he could earn. Because when he was growing up, there was precious little money around the house. Sometimes not even a nickel to spare, and a nickel is what it cost in his youth to buy a comic book. A Superman or Batman and Robin, or even one of those about famous Americans, George Washington, for instance, or better still, a famous inventor such as Thomas Edison. 
Jim Johnard uh, felt the love felt the love with the art of fell in love ah uh, yeah okay fell in love with the art of reading by dis devouring the comics he preferred them to playing with his boyhood friends he'd go next door to play find a pile of comics bury himself in them and never get outside to run around Sometimes he'd even do this at home, with comics borrowed from his friends, because he never had any nickels to spend on them himself. His father would call him for supper and get furious, because no answer. He'd call all around the block, calling, and all the time Jim would be snug in a corner inside the house, reading away and not hearing. I would get so engrossed in reading, I literally couldn't hear anything else, Jim recalls. It's still that way. Reading is something so special. His dad was a lightweight prize fighter, good enough to beat a future champion before his wife-to-be uh, ruled fight or get married, but not both. Um, can't make out all the handwritten notes on this, um, but the father opted for coal mining and marriage, um, in which he was injured when Jim was 14. By 15, Jim was driving a coal truck, shoveling on and off, doing a man's work. Books at home? There weren't any. His folks didn't read to him, and they didn't read for themselves. Neither had the chance to graduate from high school. It was not what you would call uh, oh. It was not what you would call a Very cultural atmosphere, Jim remembers. With the help of a neighbor who gave him a free place in a private kindergarten, Jim learned to read early. That developed my interest in everything. I read everything. Cereal boxes, the dictionary, comic books, especially comic books. My friends had money I didn't have, so when I went to their houses, I'd borrow their stack of comics instead of going out to play. As many coal miners' families do, we moved from mining camp to mining camp. In second grade, I went to a one-room school so I could sit there and listen to even the sixth graders and their reading lessons and other subjects. That just about spoiled me for the third grade when I went back to a one-grade classroom and had to suffer through material I'd already gone beyond the year before. Result, a permanent or almost permanent disaffection for school. All the school books already had been read before the end of the first month. The rest of the year, the subject matter was boring. The teachers were uninspiring. The comics made me fall in love with the art of reading itself, and that's something that has stayed with me all my life. You're glad that you were homeschooled. If you'd been in public school, you would have been in special ed classes and took until you were nine before you learned to read. But once you did, you took off and were always several grade levels ahead. Yeah, I think um, it's very individual. Like education itself and learning itself is very, very individual and uh, the way that our public schools are set up, there isn't always the necessary, um, there's often too many students for one teacher to be able to devote the amount of time necessary for every individual student to be able to tailor 
learning to the actual needs of each individual student. Um, so if you do are someone who learns differently or has different needs, um, it's easy to be left behind uh, because teachers don't necessarily have the capacity to be able to devote the, the amount of time necessary to alter lessons, etc. It's, it's a structural issue and I don't think it's necessarily a motivational issue or a, a an issue of desire on the part of um, our educators, uh, but it's definitely a problem. Like, I have, I have trouble doing basic arithmetic to this day, um, probably because of when I was in elementary school, I just couldn't get my brain around the way that they had me doing arithmetic. Um, and when I see, when I see, um, what's referred to or has been referred to as new math and its approach to arithmetic, it makes so much more sense to me. And I think if I had learned that in elementary school, I might be able to do arithmetic without basically hitting a mental wall. Um, so yeah, it's, I, his story was a really good illustration of how some people will click with one thing and not with another. and. Um, I'm glad that he found a way to engage with books and engage with learning in a way that um, served him well. Let's see, the next one that we have here is Nina Keenan. I think that's the beginning. Let me see if I can. I'm trying to figure out where the beginning is. <laughs> I think it's here. Let, let's do this. This was paper clipped to it, so I think this is the notes and this is the write-up. Uh, the Heart is a Lonely Hunter describes the efforts of five lonely people to break out of their isolation and make contact with the indifferent world outside. Filled with impressions out of her childhood, it creates a richly detailed, integrated version of the private and public life of a small Georgia mill town. Carson worked steadily on the novel for two years. For the two years she lived in Charlotte, two years which in spite of the barren locale she was later, later to describe as the happiest years of her life, she had a phenomenal understanding of another vulnerable, vulnerable being. She can give so freely, more freely than anyone I know in the world of, in the world of letters. Carson made February House her home for the next five years, though she made extended and frequent visits to Yaddo, the writer's colony in Saratoga Springs, and back to Georgia. But with all its excitement, noise, and the continuous comings and goings of sensational personalities, February House began to tell on her health, and one wonders how congenial it was to the discipline of constant work that had been so essential to the writing of Thalia. Of... Tile? I don't know how that's pronounced. Uh, while in Columbus, only 23 years old, she suffered the first in a series of strokes that were to plague her the rest of her life. The member of the wedding recalls with uncanny accuracy the language and feelings of adolescent love and loneliness. From Taylor, Ta Ta I, I just don't know how that's said, I'm sorry. I want, I want, I want was all that she could think about, but just what this real want was, she did not know. Uh, Carson McCullers published her first novel, Tile, in this 
spring of 1940, when she was just 23 years old, with its publication M, first, with its publication, McCullers first gave full expression to a concern that was to be the basis of almost everything she would write, a concern for man's spiritual isolation, his revolt against that isolation, and his need to achieve a perfect communion with others. That book is a story of five lonely people, each of them isolated, desperate for understanding from those around them, and tragically incapable of rendering the kind of love and understanding each of the others need. Yet because of their painful struggles with an indifferent, hostile environment, these people often inspire the sympathy and respect that we might not expect to feel for grotesques and freaks. McCullers has been remarkably successful in fusing the separate histories of each individual into one story. McCullers, quote, like a voice in the fugue, each one of the main characters is an entirety in himself, but his personality takes on a new richness which, when contrasted and woven in with the other characters. A girl of about 12, who looked like, like a very young boy, Mick, whom McCullers in her outline calls the most outstanding character in the book, is certainly its most fully realized and probably its most normal personality. Drawing on her own memories of what it was like to be a precocious girl growing up in a dull mill town in the South, McCullers has invested Mick with all the vague but terrible yearnings of a frustrated adolescent as well as with the charm and obnoxiousness of the neighborhood brat. Mick comes slowly to realize that the grim realities around her, her parents' poverty in particular, threaten to dash all hopes for the future. Yet the more she feels the grinding pressures from the outside world, the more Mick longs to fulfill her deep inner aspirations. The feeling was, I want, I want, etc. The Colors proceeds in the second part of the novel to show each of her characters struggling in his own way to break out of the isolation and to establish some meaningful relations with the world outside. All efforts, however, seem doomed from the start. Wishing to express himself fully, but impatient with the opinions of others, each character finds himself yelling at those who will not understand or cursing to himself in solitude. These descriptions are really well written. <laughs> like they take the interviews and then they turn them into these lovely descriptions. Um, and they've, they've done a really good job with that. Uh, let's see, what, what do we have here? Ken Raglan, Director of Personnel at Boeing. <clears throat> I don't understand how these tie together. All right, we'll look at this one and see where it takes us. So the, these short little things, these seem to be just like notes at this point, and this eight and a half by 11 page is the actual write-up of the interview. Um, so we're gonna read that. Coleman. I was sure I had found a rhythm in my life that men and women in those cars must envy. My job didn't have much status or pay, but it had a sense of immediate utility and also of peace. The perspective on Haverford begins to get clearer. I'm sure now that Haverford has two core missions by which it must finally be judged, to provide a quality education and to teach its students how to live with their fellow human beings in trust and concern. The hours when I stood idle this week didn't seem to help me think about those tests for the college and for myself. It was the hours when my muscles were most in play which seemed to give me the time and the desire to get things straight in my head. 
Gus Reed has brought my arms, legs, back, and a small part of my brain has bought my arms, legs, back, and a small part of my brain for $2.75 an hour. That's a fair bargain, because he has left the rest of my brain to use as I wish. So if I'm clearing cobwebs and anxieties out of my mind through this work experience, it is not because I have come to live among simpler, happier, or even better folks. It is because I am not fully engaged here, and their work and a small glimpse of their lives let me see my own work and life in a new light. I'm learning more about what we have in common than about what drives us apart. The truth is that we are all somewhat mixed up, and some of us in both worlds are happy about even that fact. In some ways, I have a different life here. The work is obviously changed. I get, I get rather than give orders. The clothes are different. The boss chooses what I wear on the job. The hours are shorter. I have no duties for the oyster house beyond the 60 plus hours on the time clock. The room where I live is only about the size of one of the 13 rooms in my campus home. It's also the best single measure of how difficult this work is from my usual, or how different this work is from my usual kind. More dramatic than the contrast in what I do, what I wear, or where I find my direction. Is the jump from a world of so much paper to one of none at all. I imagine my secretaries would appreciate this change even more than I. There's not a single thing to be filed at the close of the day. This urge to get away in order to return refreshed was one that I did not talk aloud about at, the t at that time. It was still a pipe dream deep inside me. What I did instead is what teachers and preachers so often do. I recommend it for others. From my inauguration talk onward, I challenged our students to seek a deeper blending of the world outside academics and the world inside. It is a case that springs instead from an awareness of how much isolation there is in all our lives. That was when my resolve to enter the blue collar world once again, no matter how briefly or tentatively, changed from a vague thought to a firm commitment to myself. I didn't fancy myself a missionary, a healer, or even a teacher. I still don't. I didn't think I was going to put America together again. My motive was much more selfish than that. I felt compelled to try to learn some lessons forgotten or never understood about the world of work. Until I did that, I'd be less alive than I wanted to be in the rest of the 1970s. Whatever comes, I expect to do a better job at home because I got away. Now I think I may even have found some part of it, his identity, along the way, instead of leaving it behind. Blue Collar Journal is the story of a college president entering a world where he took rather than gave orders. On leave from Haverford University, he dug ditches for $2.75 an hour, put, aside, put together salads in a restaurant, and collected garbage. He found the work cleared cobwebs and anxieties out of his mind. He discovered that working as a laborer helped him to see his own work and life in a new light. He gained new understanding of the blue-collar worker's life, er, work and life. The truth is that we are all somewhat mixed up, he concluded, and some of us in both worlds are happy about even that fact. Instead of leaving his identity behind, he had found it in the world of work. When he returned to the academic world, he challenged the students to seek a deeper blending of the world outside academics and the world inside. What else do we have? The mail brought a big fat envelope 
Mrs. Ann Garcia, English teacher in Cheyenne Central High School, Cheyenne, Wyoming, had read about our visit and project in the Cheyenne newspaper and had assigned each of her students to write us a letter about the book that made the difference. Sadly, some of them do very little reading, she explained. However, I have asked them not to lie or try to impress you. Six dozen or more letters there were, a few typewritten, most in longhand, all in good form, encouragingly with, uh, with encouragingly few spelling errors. There were particularly well done ones by Rhonda Eisner, uh, Tayaba Maz Mazar, Penny Brutzman, Mavis Rostron, Jackie Hunter, Nancy Parrish, Jeff Pondo, Charles Mellet, and Chris Miculus, among others. A few wrote, I haven't read much, in fact, I have never finished reading a book. Or, there is no book because I really don't read. But most had a choice and described it clearly. No student book, though, made as dramatic a change in her in life as did the teacher's selection. When I was a youngster, I was absolutely smitten by my number one hobby and love, horses. So my mother read My Friend Flicka to me by Mary Alsop Sturevasa. I did not know her name was even longer than Mary Alsop. Anyway. Um, and I was instantly transported to the Wyoming countryside, to the rolling green hills with the massive thundercloud, thunderhead clouds. I knew the smell of sagebrush before I ever truly smelled it, and I experienced the dramatic snowstorms before I had to plow my way through them. I registered at the University of Wyoming, although I didn't know a soul in the state except the university registrar with whom I had corresponded, corresponded since I was 11. I boarded the train. As we began to climb into the mountains near Laramie, I found Mary O'Hara had described everything so well I almost expected to see Ken McLaughlin sitting astride Flicka on the bluffs. Now, even when the winter winds rage at a hefty 80 miles per hour, I am not sorry. I listened to her call. The prairies, the mountains, the trout streams, the clouds, the low population and the exciting, changeable weather are reasons enough to love this state. I'd say that book made a difference to her. She read the book and decided at 11 to start corresponding with the registrar from the University of Wyoming and eventually went there and stayed in Wyoming. That is a big impact that that book had on her life. We are getting close to the end of the stream. Um, probably only have time for maybe one more. I do think that we hit on this folder and this folder has just been gold. Um, lots of really good stories. Um, and this is the core of what this project was, is these stories. So if, if you want more, <laughs> That book does exist, um, the actual book, Books That Made the Difference, What People Told Us. It is still available from what I could tell. Um, of course, if you are in uh, Southwest Virginia and you want to stop by Virginia Tech Special Collections and University Archives and access this collection, it is open for research. So you just need to contact us um, in advance to schedule an appointment because um, at the moment, we are still appointment only due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but we, we welcome the public to come in and access these materials. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? These are numbered pages, but uh, they're not all in order, so. trying to find another coherent story to read. Well, 
we may look at another folder or we may just leave it there. I think we've had some good stories, um, had some good recommendations from people in the chat, including, uh, I'm gonna scroll back and get them, uh, Gene Stratton Porter, uh, Freckles, and A Girl of the Limberlost, um, as well as uh, the Countess uh, Orsi, um, the Scarlet Pimpernel. Uh, so those are a couple of recommendations from the chat. Um, also, it seems like people really connected with Heidi as um, one of the better books. Um, and we had some come up uh, from the actual uh, archival materials. Um, my brain is, let's see, uh, Eric Frome, uh, uh, titles by Eric Frome. Um, who was a German social psychologist, psychoanalyst, sociologist, humanistic philosopher, and democratic socialist. Um, so those are some of the highlights of what we saw today in um, the Books That Made the Difference project collection. Uh, I am going to... Honestly, I'm just going to leave this book up on the screen for the moment. Uh, we will uh, look at what we're going to be doing for next week's archival adventures because I'm doing better about planning ahead. Um, right, for episode 12 of Archival Adventures next Wednesday at 2.30 p.m., we are going to look at the Blacksburg Women's Club records. So let me tell you just a little bit about those. Um, from the finding aid. Just give me one second to pull it up here because I didn't do that in advance. Um, came close. Here we go, uh, covering 1907 to 1972. Arising from a desire to improve the cultural and environmental aspects of life in the Blacksburg area, the Women's Civic Betterment Club was founded in 1907, led by its first president, Mrs. R. H. Hudnall. The organization became affiliated with the Virginia Federation of Women's Clubs in 1912 and was renamed the Blacksburg Women's Club in 1914. Throughout the next several decades, the club was involved in a number of local civic improvement projects involving community beautification, public health, civil defense, charity, and cultural programs. The Blacksburg Garden Club was originally a committee within the Blacksburg Women's Club before voting to form an independent organization in 1930. Another offshoot organization, the Blacksburg Junior Women's Club, was created in 1935 and continues to be active today, 2003. Uh, the club disbanded in 1970. So we do have the records of the Blacksburg Women's Club, um, and that is what we are going to look at next week um, as we approach the very end. Honestly, next week, I think it'll be the 31st. So it'll be the very end of Women's Month. Um, we have a, a couple things coming up next month in April um, as we approach. Uh, so April is when uh, is Pride Month here on Virginia Tech's campus. So we will be looking at some LGBTQ plus collections um, during April, as well as April 16th being um, the anniversary of the Virginia Tech shootings. Uh, so on the 14th of April, I believe we will be looking at some materials from the condolence collection. Um, that episode, I will make sure that there are notes in the, um, in the title information to let people know specifically what we're looking at. Uh, but looking back to 2007, um, when that happened here on campus. Uh, so that is going to be the end of Archival Adventures for today. Again, this was the Books That Made the Difference project collection, and I hope that you all had a good time. 
Um, it's lovely having you all visit every Wednesday and explore these materials with me. I'm quite enjoying this part of my job um, and I hope that you're enjoying watching. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and set us up to do some raiding uh, and carry this off to some other lovely people. Um, it looks like we're probably gonna do the Monterey Bay Aquarium today. Uh, just based on who I see online at the moment. So um, they are doing, it looks like they have penguin cam up today. So um, enjoy uh, watching the penguins at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. It's been lovely having you all here and I will see you next time.